안녕하십니까 한 캐나다 오픈 세미나에 참석해 주신 모든 분들 환영합니다 저는 오늘 행사의 사회자 김예원입니다 반갑습니다 Good evening and thank you for joining us this evening My name is Jennifer Kim and I'll be your MC tonight As tonight's event is delivered in a Zoom meeting format We ask you mute your sound throughout the seminar for an uninterrupted experience 주 토론토 총영사관은 포스트 코로나 시대 다양한 분야의 협의를 할수 있기 위해 캐나다 한 교수 협의회와 공동으로 한 캐나다 오픈 세미나 시리즈를 진행하고 있습니다. The Korean Consulate in Toronto has organized an open seminar series in collaboration with the Korean Canadian University Professors Forum to promote cooperation in various fields for the post-COVID era. Before we start the seminar, we'll first hear from the Council General. 오늘 강연 소개에 앞서 먼저 김득환 총영사님의 환영사가 있겠습니다. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, indeed, for participating in the Korea-Canada Open Seminar tonight. Before we go further, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor c h i g e n Lee, President of the Korean Canadian University Professors Forum and member professors who support the seminar series. A special thanks to today's speaker, Professor Charles Jo from York University. Taking this opportunity, it is a great pleasure for me to say a few words in front of many friends of Korea. well equipped with passion and love. As you are no doubt aware, the coronavirus has now penetrated on every corner of everyday life. COVID-19 is a once-in-a-lifetime threat to humanity that has inflicted immeasurable suffering on billions of people. As business shut and international travel came to a halt, COVID-19 became not only a health crisis, but also an economic crisis of global proportion. Given that countries differ in their capacity to deal with pandemics, the importance of multilateral cooperation cannot be overemphasized. Against this backdrop, Today's lecture will offer fresh and fascinating insight into the realities and the illusions ensued from the ongoing social and environmental changes and our role in society to tackle the crisis wisely moving forward. You will find this seminar more vivid and intriguing because it's based on recent research conducted and published by the speaker. Thank you. I wish you the very best in your future study and work. 감사합니다, 총영사님. Thank you, Council General. 오늘 세미나 연사는 요크대학교 슐릭 비즈니스 스쿨 회계학과 교수이신 조유철 교수님입니다. 조유철 교수님의 전문 분야는 사회 및 환경 회계, 기업의 사회적 책임, 회계 및 공익 등으로 주요 학술지의 다수의 연구를 발표한 바 있습니다. 교수님은 현재 회계 포럼의 편집자이자 저널 오브 비즈니스 에픽스의 회계 및 비즈니스 윤리 섹션 공동 편집자로 활동하는 등 학술 커뮤니티에 적극적으로 참여하고 있습니다. 최근 대한민국 총리 및 교육부 장관이 선정한 50대 학술 연구 지원 사업에 선정되었으며 전 세계 학문 분야에서 가장 많이 인용된 학자 중한 분이시기도 합니다. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Charles H. Cho tonight. He's a professor of accounting and the e r i v a k h o p c h Business and Sustainability at the Schulich School of Business, York University. His research specialty includes social and environmental accounting, corporate social responsibility, and accounting and the public interest. Professor Cho has published his work in leading academic journals. He currently serves as an editor of Accounting Forum and the Accounting and Business Ethics Section co-chair of the Journal of Business Ethics. 
He's actively involved in the academic community as a council member of the Center for Social and Environmental Accounting Research and as a chair of his International Associates Committee. Recently, he was selected as one of the top 50 academic and research support projects by the Republic of Korea's Prime Minister and the Minister of Education. And he was recognized as one of the top 2% most cited scholars within discipline worldwide. 오늘 조유철 교수님께서 코로나 시대 지속 가능성과 차적 재환상과 현 주제로 강연을 하십니다. 오늘 강연을 통해 코로나 시대 속 지속 가능한 사회와 포용적 성장에 관해 배우는 유익한 시간이 되기를 바랍니다. 강연 후에 질의응답 시간도 마련되어 있으니 궁금하신 점은 채팅창에 미리 질문을 남겨주시면 되겠습니다. Tonight, Professor Cho will be sharing his expertise on the theme of COVID-19, sustainability and social responsibility, illusions and realities. We hope you find the session useful and interesting at the same time. There will be a Q&A session afterwards, so if you have any questions about today's topic, please share your questions using the chat function. 그럼 이제 조유철 교수님을 모시겠습니다. Please welcome Professor Cho. Okay, I assume uh, everybody can see the slide. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this uh, open series, open seminar series, um, the Korean Consulate. Um, thank you for the organizers, the Consul and Professor Lee. Um, I am uh, very um, honored to be here. Um, I'd like to start with uh, uh, three caveats. Uh, the first is that uh, I'm a professor of accounting, but we will not talk a lot about accounting today. I'm wearing my hat as the uh, chair of business sustainability at the Schulich School of Business. Um, the second part is um, there are some references to Korean um, uh, research and Korean um, indication, but I will not, uh, I'm not an expert per se in Korean context field, but I'm happy to, of course, answer questions. Um, so, Without um, further ado, let me uh, get on the, the, the topic here. Um, as you can see, the title um, should reflect some of the current events. Um, hopefully, something can relate to some of the personal life, uh, but also at the society level as a member of society and in terms of uh, responsibility and the environment. So let me actually try um, something right off the top to maybe, if you can, uh, and you have done this before, use a chat function to just type any words uh, that come to your mind when you read or hear the words sustainability or sustainable development, corporate social responsibility. And this is not a quiz or anything, it's just to get a feel for how would you personally perceive those words. When you hear that in a conversation or you read something, um, what are the things that come uh, to mind? And I'm hoping I can um, uh, see that. Oops, sorry about that. Yeah, I see some, okay, very interesting. Survival, equity, fairness, future state, long-term efforts, okay, outside profit maximization, future, great. Anyone else? None of this is uh, going to stay or recorded. Uh, stakeholders, great. Yeah, so all of these terms relate around to long-term um, value maybe and uh, stakeholders uh, beyond maybe a shareholder um, focus, investments, uh, and also some aspect, of course, of the physical environment, right? So let me... A infographic. I mean, you can see some graphics here on the slides on uh, what is, I'm not here to define and explain a lecture of corporate social responsibility, but I assume that some of you have heard this term CSR uh, somewhere along your uh, personal interaction, professional readings. Um, you've been exposed to these notions of what does it mean. So uh, for an organization such as a private corporation, 
there's a purpose that is um, actually dictated by the law. Um, and then uh, when they go beyond uh, that fiduciary duty, the legal duty of what a company is supposed to be doing, uh, then you have things like, um, okay, we're talking about long-term goals and long-term vision, um, uh, the use of resources, the allocation of resources, the responsible use of resources, uh, sustainability as a, a component that is obviously very huge. Uh, you probably heard about the word ethics and obviously responsibility, talking about market sincerity. This is not an exhaustive list of terms. These are terms that are related to corporate social responsibility um, per se. Um, you can see that there's a, also criticism is like, can a corporation be actually socially responsible by definition? Um, there's also some uh, terminology like business ethics. Can business be actually be ethical, right? There's a lot of critical theories, critical perspective that would tell you that these are not compatible, right? So that to give you an idea of what a company as a, a socially responsible entity uh, could do uh, or should do. Then we get to this notion of uh, sustainable development and I put AKA sustainable for a reason. I'll tell you why in a second. So these terms uh, is not a new, new term. Um, in 1987, the United Nations uh, commissioner at the time uh, for the environment was Dr. Uh, Brutland. Um, and she defined it as meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the of operations to meet their own needs. A lot of loaded terms here, but you can see that is a pretty broad and deep definition of timeliness in terms of temporal aspects, today, tomorrow, the needs, the generations. And we are actually talking about multiple generations, not the next generations. And I did say that I, I, I put AKA sustainability because even then, even now, uh, there's going to be some kind of contradiction of can you actually be sustainable by developing the business, All right? So it could be, is there really such a thing as sustainable development? If you develop something, you maybe you're not that sustainable. So that's why uh, the word, those two terms could have sort of got dropped along the way and people start talking more about sustainability, which you will see during the presentation towards the end that that term also comes with some potential issues. But this is the idea of what sustainability means or sustainable development. Some of the core concept comes with uh, the idea of, uh, in terms of our, our planet, uh, a very broad and high level, uh, social, uh, social economic justice. And as the definition uh, provided, the, this uh, generational um, temporal responsibility for future generations. Uh, so basically, uh, is there going to be enough resources uh, for all and forever? So you encompass the idea of, uh, you know, physical resources, the environment, the physical environment uh, for the people living on Earth, which is our population, our society, and is it going to last for a long time? Right. Um, in terms of um, representing this. You're going to see some circles here during this presentation. So you it's like combining the social environment and economic aspects, not having one or two of the aspects, but really have the intersection of those three circles to call itself a sustainable future or a sustainable organization. If you have only two of the three, you can see some of the terms that, yes, I mean, they are in terms of social environment without the economic uh, may not really sustain, may not survive because you still need the financial uh, and economic force behind it. Same thing for equitable uh, without the environment, if you neglect the environment and if you neglect the social, then you have a viable society, but not really a sustainable society because you are not focusing on the social justice. None of these circles has to be in equal uh, proportion. It's nicely done here because to illustrate uh, some perspective, you can see that um, maybe what we are actually living today has an uh, unbalanced uh, circle between the economy and society and the environment. The economy is such a big piece, the, the corporate is so big, uh, it's too big to fail. Um, and then it sort of like dominates the society, it, it sort of takes over and the environment comes so, sort of um, uh, at last. Or you have the other extreme perspective, which comes from nature's perspective, 
I said the ecosystem is too big to fail, which ideally that should be sort of almost a case where the economy is only one piece of the society. When I talk about the economy, it can range from the actual national economy, uh, global economy, but also financial markets. Uh, as a member of society, just like another stakeholder, and as a society, as we know, we all depend on the environment, which we obviously uh, use and uh, you will see abuse. So th those circles are not necessarily the nice three circles I've seen, but the three elements still hold of what makes up a, a sustainable something, right? A sustainable organization, sustainable society, a sustainable city. Um, I think, I mean, I'm assuming that you have heard maybe uh, since 2015, the United Nations put up um, a, a very nice infographically represented 17, uh, what they call the global goals or the sustainable development goals or SDGs to make it uh, shorter where they go by each area of our life that are, is affected or improve, uh, such as hunger, poverty, uh, education, gender equality, uh, energy, pollution, uh, consumption, um, life on land, life below water, the oceans. And each goal uh, actually is set up with a set of targets, metrics, that now um, organizations and governments are taking on board sort of like a framework to try to reach, meet those goals, uh, to try to um, make the planet a little bit less unsustainable uh, and improve our quality of life. Okay, so this is a big initiative within the nations. I really, what I say about what they've done is they try to make it as easy to understand as possible. With these graphics, they also have a, a version for the youth. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very good encouraging framework they've done. Um, They've um, also some um, research on the boundaries. Um, on Dr. Professor Rockstrom had actually put up a new documentary on Netflix, right, the Planetary Boundaries. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, he started many years ago to look at the planet, the society and planet as like nine different uh, elements ranging from climate change to uh, ozone depletion to acidification to freshwater use. I'm not going to read them all here. And what he found here is his teams um, that uh, the unbalance of what's been uh, abused, what is of high risk, increasing risk, relatively safe. So you can see that the green circle, he defines it as below the boundary of our planet, we are in a safe space. And everything that goes beyond on the yellow side and especially the red side. Uh, this is the 2015 study, uh, they see that we have reached the tipping point and maybe beyond on those aspects such as genetic diversity in terms of the biodiversity, reproduction of our resources and uh, biochemical flow. If you look at the parts here, climate change, we hear a lot about, land system change, etc. So I, I listened to Professor Rockstrom actually last month at a conference at the European Economic Association. Actually, it was an excellent um, talk. And, even though he describes it, the planet in a, such a bad state, there is still a bit of hope that for him, uh, and that we believe so, in the next few years, if we do something about it, we should be hopefully to able to, to move the needle and, and um, improve the, the situation. But it's, it's going to take a lot of effort. Um, there are also some research and, and data that is done on terms of how many Earths does it take to support our lifestyle as, as human beings? Right, so the Global Footprint Network, which I cite this uh, uh, graph from, um, measures, uh, has been measuring how is our, our footprint uh, in relation to what the, the Earth has to offer. So basically, you have a limited amount of resources available on our planet, right? There are resources that are not uh, indefinitely rep reproducible. Um, and today, um, we have un increased our footprint so much that we have beyond 1.7 planet needs to sustain our lifestyle, all right? So you can see that from the 1970, it was, I mean, since 60 to 70, it was below one. And then from the 70s on when the whole industrialization and the whole economy started booming and there were a lot of development, well, we have obviously uh, reached the point where we are actually living on a line of credit, if you put it that way, uh, it's like having a credit card without having the money in your bank. And we are just surfing on uh, these resources 
And that's why we call it that we have a sustainability problem. It's not sustainable. We reached a point where we're going to almost need two Earth if we go that way in uh, uh, 10 years' time, 20, 30, or less than 10 years, right? So this is sort of like a, a sort of concern when you look at this. Um, uh, some of the, uh, of course, all human uh, activity is not equal, right? Per, if we do it per country analysis, so the, the, the world biocapacity uh, is calculated by basically what is the world uh, hectares in like, in terms of size, uh, resource available. We have 7.4 billion people, so it becomes 1.63. It's very, very simplified. I, I made it simple to present here today, but it comes from the Living Planet report. And you can see that as a uh, uh, Earth average 1.7, as I mentioned, but there's a large variance across countries. So I highlighted the countries of our interest today. We are uh, in Canada as a the Korean consulate uh, maybe some of you or the country are represented here. Um, you can see that it varies widely. Um, some countries, as expected in developing country in Africa, Congo, they are needed half an earth. And some other ones need almost seven, like in Qatar. And then you have things, numbers in between. Where in Canada, we are not that great. We have five earth and Korea. Uh, having a very fast growth um, uh, rate that we had. It's all also based, taking into account the land availability in the population, which explains maybe the lower number of China as well. But still, you can see that a lot of the countries in the West, um, developed country, are way, be way above one, right? So the other developing world are the ones who pull the mean down to 1.7, because if you go to probably the whole African continent, is probably below one, right? So you can see the, the contrast here. And um, there is this, maybe you have heard this in the media as well. Uh, they talk a lot about what are the overshoot day? So they, they compute by country. Uh, at what point will you reach, what point during the year will you reach the day that your country you basically exhausted them? You have used all of the resources available. And by then you are, after that, you are overshot, right? So there are a lot of countries here but a country of interest, Canada, March 14. It's been a long time. We have exhausted, in terms of ecological footprint, uh, the resources available to us as a population and as a country. Uh, Republic of Korea, not a lot better, April 5th. And of course, if you go around the circle, well, you will see that the more, the later the overshoot day, well, you're gonna see countries from emerging and developing countries, such as in South America, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, et cetera. And you can retrieve here correlated to the number of Earths that you've seen uh, needed. Qatar, like February 9th, that's it. They have used all of the resources, right? So some of them calculated on February 9th. In Indonesia or Ecuador is in December. Okay, so it's quite striking when you see the huge variance. Obviously, there's over 190 countries in the world, but still, to see that, um, it's quite striking. So I'm sure. So the, the, the problem is that we have come, this is a bit of a humor uh, cartoon, I think of one of the CSR sustainability uses it uh, a lot, but the, to the point where we have um, you know, uh, focused a lot of energy and resources and foc um, uh, attention to uh, the business and making as much money as you can, making as much return as we can, the profit maximizing model has led to maybe the complete um, destruction of Earth. And so we could be sitting there in a few decades uh, that yes, okay, we have created a lot of value for shareholders, but where's the planet, right? So in bonfire, you can see those, uh, those kids here, or those people are, are not so happy and impressed. Um, and indeed, beyond the physical and sustainable problems that we have, we have people who are not happy, okay? These there are angry people out there who are protesting uh, against uh, the way that you know, governments are run, companies are managed, um, how the policies are not making improvements. And the big topic also about a lot of inequalities. Uh, you can see for environmental inequalities, you will also see some lot of social inequalities, right? So these are like movements. Uh, these are not new at all, right? This is 
Occupy LA is actually several years old, but this is an example. So this leads me to the, the topic of inequality. So first, this very powerful quote. When you see that this is true today that you know a few people um, or one person sometimes could have more wealth than a billion people combined, then you have to think that as, as a human human system, okay, in a society, maybe something went wrong here. Okay, it's okay to have uh, somebody who deserves more because they worked harder, because that's maybe the model of capitalism. But when you go from one to one billion and you have the earth, I mean, you have to do the, the wealth uh, distributed that way, you know, maybe uh, something went wrong in the system. Some uh, sources that I am just putting out from those, those sources uh, reach us to 1% uh, own 40% of the world's wealth. And you can see that, you know, by broken down by categories of wealth, um, the population share here, and then the blue goes to uh, on the left here. So a very skewed uh, graph between the blue and the reds. Uh, that's from 2019. So this is quite recent. Um, another one uh, per countries, uh, per um, yeah, individuals looking at countries. So you have a 10, and it's actually men, um, you know, the CEOs of, uh, multinational companies uh, are richer than some countries. All of these countries have lower wealth than these 10 people. Okay. And you can even, I even saw that one wealth, one person's wealth could be richer than some country. I think like the CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos is richer than some countries. Okay. So when you have that, yeah, you can argue all you want about that. Yeah. He probably deserved it. He worked really hard. He's very smart. A very good businessman, but at some point maybe there is an extreme that we need to maybe consider and see uh, how did this happen, right? Here is I'm switching a bit gear. This is my little uh, Korean page uh, because I am, uh, you know, I did a, a bit of Korean study in CSR, but I want to. I think it's relevant because um, CSR, as I mentioned, is not necessarily perceived the same way from various countries, right? From the West. You know, in the United States, in the West Canada, Western Europe, uh, it's not the same as in uh, you know, South Korea or other countries. So this is a, a recent uh, paper that I've actually done with a former PhD student, uh, Amy Shin, and two other colleagues um, or looked at, and this is part of her, her dissertation, uh, look at how Korean um, uh, professionals uh, are uh, seeing themselves and CSR. So... I'm just going to put, I uh, hope you can see that if you, you have a big screen, but that's a one table that's sort of like a big high level summary where in Korea, when there was, she did interviews um, talking to people who are working in the CSR uh, area, there is, you know, there's, there's a lot of jobs in, in different type of organizations, consulting, private NGOs. Um, so you have uh, a type of discourse that they talk like a strategic uh, corporate giving. And here, CSR programs should be more focused on adding value for intending uh, the programs um, to take into account the resources available to the company and the benefits. And so this is like a typical you know, voice of a social worker who is trying to recognize both the social and the corporate mi um, uh, mindset and, and come up with his definition of CSR, as opposed to uh, somebody who would uh, look at CSR and, and social issues as a opportunity, but in a good way, it's innovative to create uh, a, a better value, uh, even financial returns. Uh, it's quite a proactive approach, and this is really entrepreneurial. So we're seeing like this is a social entrepreneur uh, having very creative ideas, innovative ideas to improve society, and at the same time try to improve also the financial bottom line. But this is a slightly different than the, the first one because here you have like that whole innovation aspect. Here this is the third one. Uh, we've seen uh, people who are very much risk, uh, risk management oriented, right? Risk management discourse uh, from a business perspective. Uh, CSR is about how to manage the risk, how to manage the impact. And so it's more a strategy, right? Than more an aspiration. Uh, and this is basically typical consultants, CSR consultants, sustainability consultants uh, in Korea think 
that way that, yeah, it's another opportunity to improve, yes, but also to manage the risk, uh, to mitigate the risk. And finally, the last one, uh, as it's then indicate, trans transition discourse is, this is like activist voice, okay? I'm going to change the way the system works. This is a very progressive mindset, and this is an umbrella that could transform capitalism. These are, these are the words of some of the interviewees that they see themselves as the saver and uh, changing the system to improve the world. A lot of these have one common point. They are actually genuinely interested in improving society. It's just they're coming from a, such a different perspective. And we've seen that in, in Korea also have embraced a lot of the Western culture. Well, I'm not going to go into, obviously, Korean history of business, but uh, a, a lot of influence from uh, some of the, the, the pioneer um, American um, research on CSR impacted the way that CSR is perceived as well. So it's a bit of a Westernization, yet we've seen some also uh, Korean aspect of this. And of course, you wonder maybe why is he not talking about COVID? Yeah, well, I think we're gonna talk enough about COVID. You heard enough about COVID for the last year and a half. Uh, and I'm saying like this came along um, and we know that it has changed profoundly and maybe forever uh, certain things and things will not, maybe not go, not go back to normal or not go back like before. Maybe things have improved. Maybe things have gotten worse, right? So I'm gonna speak of COVID-19 in the terms of all of the issues I've talked so far, right? So how has COVID-19 impacted certain things um, in terms of social responsibility and sustainability? One thing that also I found is we look at COVID-19 and I'm, I'm a true believer that even though we are so deeply impacted by the pandemic that the other issues remain still at a higher level bigger. Those problems existed before COVID and you will see that they will persist and maybe go worse. I mean, I'm not saying COVID-19 is, is, is not big, obviously that is huge, but economic recession, climate change and biodiversity issues have been there for a while and they continue to be. And just to illustrate, I found this, I think, graphical representation of what other issues beyond COVID-19 could be. Of course, a lot, a lot of it is sort of interrelated, uh, interdependent, uh, impacted with each other, obviously. But I'll just give you the, the, the bigger picture here. So another recent study I've done with a marketing colleague uh, from uh, Concordia University in HEC Montreal was looking at the first, uh, this is a Canadian study. So I think this is good to bring also the context. Like what has the government and com companies have done, have said uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, how have they shared it or not? And I'm just gonna put you some quotes of some data that we, we had. We analyzed speeches of government policy, so Trudeau and other policymakers, uh, other government officials, and tweets from company. I'm not gonna put a lot here, but at the beginning, you see in March, this is obviously 2020. Uh, this was a lot about set preliminary priorities and the role of consumers. The government is saying, you stay home, but you see the language change over the week. You should stay home. We encourage you to stay home, stay home. Okay, it became quite the tone. If you read the whole speech, I'm gonna put it here. Uh, the tone changes over days. Okay, there's changes in the way the communication is done. Um, you will see in, in, in some other aspects that quite interesting um, uh, communication strategies. And this is another one from um, the government, the policymaker. Most of them are from Trudeau, actually, uh, Justin Trudeau. So um, here there are consumers uh, to help with each other. The government is like, okay, you help someone else. You take care of your neighbor. You take care of your siblings or your family. Okay, you direct them to a hotline. You are part of the solution. So this is discharging the responsibility of the COVID-19 uh, problem pandemic to us. Okay, and I'm not saying it's, it's bad. This is what we observe. This is all in the matter of a few weeks after the pandemic has started and lockdown has started, et cetera, right? Got to realize that response. That's why 
we call it now no more responsibility, but you notice the word responsibilization. I know it's a mouthful word. We came up with this word, say like making people responsible for the things, right? Now, two more here. Uh, some other statements of uh, uh, to adapt and accept. So now it's like, we're not in the woods yet. Do not uh, uh, loosen up. Uh, even when the weather gets nice, I mean, we heard this speech over and over again, up and down during the year, but this is at the, again, early stage of the pandemic. Uh, we need to follow the rules or we're gonna lose the progress. And you know, after that, it's been sort of a, you know, repeating tape uh, every time there was a lockdown, every time there's a cases uh, increase, et cetera. Uh, so now you're telling us more now what to do and adapt. And what's been interesting last but least is then the firms, the companies, you probably have received uh, some emails. This is actually what I've motivated to do this study. All of a sudden, companies were sending emails to say, hey, we're going to take care of you. Don't worry. We're with you. We stand by you, et cetera. I don't know about you, but I got all kinds of things from you know, travel uh, websites and restaurants that you, they have your email address, they will send you that. Well, what have they have done afterwards, like this is from TD Bank, that uh, they are going to charge, take responsibility. They are going to tell you what to do to help you out. So it was a really a, a shift of responsibility of who does what, who tells what, what to do. And then a lot of it, I think, for the shoulder of consumers, but also companies, trying to do whatever they can. I'm taking the position here. I'm just telling you that you can see the change of you know, discourse of who is supposed to do what. And so that got me uh, actually on a local news. I got, you know, this paper got interviewed in, on CTV. And the second one on the, on the, on the right, uh, uh, that was a lot, a lot more recent. As you can see, this is a, just a couple months old, of vaccine. So similar things happen with the vaccine where you know, most of you are in Ontario, and I know some of you are in Quebec, Canada. Uh, this was a bit of a mess at the beginning. It's gonna a lot better now, but it was more like, okay, uh, it was uh, uh, vaccine hunters that came along. And it's more like, this is me talking the quote. They, they literally, these are volunteer citizens who are giving their time, their energy, their, their, their labor to make things happen, to help other citizens. That was a remarkable aspect. But we wonder what was the, the role of the government, at least at that time, at least at the time, right? So that was sort of related to COVID-19. Obviously, when the vaccine came out, uh, similarly, you see this responsabilization that is sort of shifting uh, again. Um, okay, so this is now more onto the environment. Um, I just changed the title of my slide because the type, this paper is dealing later on with accounting stuff, and we're not going to talk about that. But this is where we talk on the front, the first half of this paper, we talk about how this has impacted the planet, just like social responsibility. So you probably heard at the beginning, very high, you know, okay, so everybody's unhappy because we cannot go anywhere, but you're thinking as an environmental, at least you go, yes, air pollution has gone down, air travel has dropped 96%, the lowest level in 75 years. Nobody's traveling, obviously. Uh, uh, you have, uh, you know, lower uh, environmental noise, what they can, clean beaches. So you have more positive stuff coming out, right? Oh, this is good for the environment, right? You are thinking, uh, now we are, uh, you know, not going to pollute as much. We can see emissions have, you know, drop here, you know, and if you do a close up here from January to May, you can see a drop in emissions uh, globally. You can see uh, industry power industry, surface tr transport, uh, residential, et cetera, all of, everything's going down, right? Obviously, nobody's, everybody stay home, right? Then we have seen some uh, pictures from the space. Uh, you see countries, so, uh, okay, so this is in, in Wuhan, obviously where the, the virus supposedly started. And uh, you can they do a comp one year comparison of the activity of Wuhan. I'm sure you have seen this in some news media or, or some readings. That you can see that obviously, okay, here is nothing happening here in January, February 2020 compared to last year. All the places in the world, all the places in the country, in China, uh, outside Wuhan, uh, you can see that the whole orange uh, dot here is no more near Beijing and nothing around here. Um, you can also see in Europe, this is uh, Italy. Okay, so, um, you know, 
a little bit of a decrease, but still there, but decrease. But in France, for example, like this dark space, uh, Paris here, the, the dark space become lighter. Um, you said in the Northeast USA, so close to us in Canada, also a much lower activity, uh, uh, flight activity, industry activity, nobody's moving, right? So you're thinking the, the air got cleaner. I think you even see some pictures of like animals coming to the city. Uh, the nature is coming back. We even had in Canada, uh, you may have heard about this, uh, green strings. So Canadian government also in, in exchange to helping uh, companies in the difficulties, they put some bailout conditions, but green stimulus, green strings, strings attached, that if you're gonna give you uh, uh, support, then you're gonna have to do something good for the environment, right? So they say, we're gonna impose standards and conditions on all these stimulus recovery spending and bailouts for Canadians' uh, life improvement, right? So I'm not gonna read them all, but these are the seven strings. So support, conditions for zero emission transition, uh, increase financial stability, uh, focus on the worker, creation of sector infrastructure, create more job, sustainable job, strengthen environmental regulation, uh, ensure transparency, accountability. And then they put a little note here that this is about more telling them what you're gonna do, disclose what you're gonna do, what, what's your plan, right? Again here, Tineke. Where is the accountability for this? What's gonna happen if you don't meet those uh, strings? So this is about you know, providing a plan for what they're going to do. But during that, it's not directly related to green strings, and this has been somewhat solved, but you have seen what the another corporate model issue, uh, Air Canada, our national airline, has just conveniently granted stock options, stock awards, and bonuses uh, from bailout money. Okay, so this has done huge backlash and they have sort of taken the back, all that. But just that, what happened during a pandemic crisis, we still have the private corporation which is going, we've got to pay the CEO his bonus, uh, the board or whatever, the C-suite, whatever. You know, nothing really has changed and they're using public money. So this is not a very smart thing to do. And some companies have done that, you know, and this is obviously the uh, of social responsibility, this is corporate irresponsibility, right? So in terms of global wealth inequality, I don't, you can almost guess, right? I think these are pretty obvious, but yeah, you have, you know, it has worsened the gap, uh, richer, rich people got richer and poor people got poor, basically, right? You've got trillions, billionaires becoming trillionaires, and you have workers who lose pretty much everything, job, wealth, savings, etc. cetera. Um, you have uh, uh, or the already poor country uh, pre-COVID and as of October, 2020, uh, extreme poverty increases. So it has created worse than the gap between the classes and the, the, the level of wealth and the level of resources that already struggling countries have, right? So. Uh, COVID-19, this is something that we don't really see much. Uh, uh, this is an important thing to note as well. And then we have the, you know, COVID-19 has done great thing for flights uh, savings, but in fact, you know, we all wear masks and these masks are highly impactful, right? You have one single use mask, single use mask. You can understand like how, this, how are they made? How are they disposed? Okay, how many are we wearing? This is a lot of people. Uh, this is just in the Oceans Asia NGO in Hong Kong. Okay, this quote from the, the founder. Well, Hong Kong has more than 7 million people. You can wear one or two masks a day. Just imagine the amount of trash generated. And Hong Kong is quite small. You can see that. So imagine in other places as an example uh, for Hong Kong here. Medical waste, the things that we don't see because they're in the hospital. So this is another, um, uh, the, the other graph, the same graph you recognize, but on the downside, you stay home, environment, but then you have increase in the waste that you consume because we, you know, cows, uh, buy things online, you name it. You got all kinds of things that led to more, more waste. 
And you know, this is data from China, I believe, yes. Uh, the, the, way, the amount of waste has just exponentially grown six times. Uh, daily output of medical waste has you know, the weight of an adult blue whale. I mean, this is huge, right? This is from you know, one country. So this is not neglectable at all. And then actually carbon dioxide have actually increased. I mean, some of the data that is shown in terms of flight and we've shown, uh, it continues actually in 2020. There was probably a drop at some point and then it just went sort of back up when there was some kind of activity that, that, that went back and that opened up. And then the SDGs, I uh, don't have the fancy color picture, but yeah, it had some effect. Um, you know, we talk about poverty, uh, we talked about uh, yeah, school education. I'm not going to get into the details of the struggles that uh, children and parents had, uh, equality, uh, resources in the water, uh, climate. Uh, COVID-19 has not helped the SDGs very well. Let's put it this way. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of work to do. Um, they were supposed to be reached in 2030, and there's not much time left. And COVID-19 has come and has pretty much delayed everything um, in terms of reaching those goals. So in any case, as of two days ago or yesterday, we are still here as a very hot planet, global warming, climate change, whatever we want to call. Uh, this is June 28th, and you've seen, you've heard the Scotia's heat wave, we call it the heat crisis, on the west coast of our country, California in the US, uh, but the whole globe right now is uh, pretty warm. Okay, and there's a big concern that this is, Things now open up, and uh, now activity is going to go back up, and this is uh, uh, something, right? So I'm going back now, after giving you this picture of COVID, to see what is also sort of the potential illusions that we have. So remember when I said sustainable development, sustainability, and that word may cause some issues. So in fact, when you talk about sustainability, and I'm talking about business here because I'm a business professor, but businesses are really caring mostly, not saying all businesses, but most businesses are mostly concerned about being less unsustainable uh, so that they can sort of manage their risk and they can operate still to benefit who? The owners, their shareholders, right? The investors create value for them. We have also a consumption issue sometimes not so responsible consumption that drives growth. And we're gonna use the, all the resources. You've seen the ecological footprint of our countries. We need five earths in Canada um, and of course, new technology. And the key message here is the word sustainability. A lot of people are imagining this word as this is social and environmental issues, CSR, great. Well, no, because businesses can use it says this is for the sustainability of the business rather than the sustainability of the planet. So it's very misleading when you think about the word sustainability. Is it about business sustainability or is it about planetary sustainability, the planet, the environment, right? So this is where it can get confusing, right? And there's a, you know, some communication rhetorics issue that can come along with this. So, Sustainability, everybody's doing sustainability. I'm gonna show you a bit of a joke here, but late in, in a couple of slides, but Ernst & Young accounting firm, how to make, we're gonna be guardians of uh, sustainability. Bank of America, sustainable finance, $1 trillion. We're not really sure what sustainable finance is. I'll show you next slide. But, you know, everybody get, gets into this, sort of this trend of, this is really the, the thing to do. Okay, so this is my comic slide. I have a few comic slides so I can make it a bit more lively. Um, this is a joke. ESG is a new term for environmental social governance. This is the acronym. And everybody's becoming ESG something. I'm an ESG consultant. I'm an ESG professor. I'm an ESG manager. I'm an ESG supplier. It's like everything is about ESG. You may not have encountered this, but trust me, in the business world, Thing, okay, being an ESG. So basically you have a title and you have ESG in front of it and you are ESG something, right? But a bit of irony here, but a bit of truth. And this is a very, very telling interview that um, this person here was the chief sustainability officer, investor officer for sustainable finance at BlackRock, the largest investment 
uh, bank in, in the world. And he left those kind of, this was a bizarre place to create social impact. Why are they trying to do this basically? There was no demonstrable positive impact on society. There was no real social impact. And then the last sentence here, is it about narrative that surrounded? Basically, is it really about talking a lot about we are cool people doing sustainable finance, sustainable accounting, sustainable reporting, sustainable whatever? Uh, and this guy quit and he just gives this open interview in like mainstream news all over. It's quite telling because from the inside, he comes outside and he left and he tells us this, right? So um, I want to switch. Uh, 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 the analogy here of why is this uh, so concerning? So I love to give this analogy because people don't expect it. So you have white tigers, zoos, and what is my area? Sustainable reporting. But this is not from me. This is from my good friend and co-author, uh, Professor Dent, uh, has given this uh, speech. And it's been, as you can see, this 2012 uh, commentary plenary talk at a conference that he wrote. Um, I don't know if you've seen white tigers before. They're beautiful animals, right? And you make, you know, this is a bit misleading as well. These animals, they're not really animals. They're not a species. Do you know how white tigers are formed? The only way they are formed is that they are genetically uh, mutated uh, by incestuously mating tigers. So in order to get white tigers, you get uh, made from the same uh, genes, uh, same um, family, and you get white tigers. So everybody is mesmerized by the beauty of, of them. It used to be at Las Vegas shows. Then he goes, he he goes to zoos, zoos, sorry, zoos. So Toronto Zoo, that's Toronto. Okay, this is one quote that he has from this novel about zoos. Nothing to do with accounting, nothing to do with sustainability. He's talking about zoo, and in zoos, you know, I like zoos too, and I'm not against zoos, but you got to realize. People watch movies, they visit the zoo, and they somehow believe that all of these animals here are okay. Okay, you may or may not think that, but a lot of people think, wow, wow, well, they're well preserved. You know, it's it's really like nature. Yeah, it's like nature, right? So rhino, panda, all of these species, they thought that they have actually seen the animals, but he argues, this guy, Quimen, they have seen images. Zoos are not fragments of the world of nature. No, they are substitutes. And why? What's got to do with sustainability? All right, so here. This is how ESG sustainability feels like today. Everybody talks about it like it's okay. We have so much talk about sustainability. They're gonna assume that everything is good in the world because we talk about it. We, talk about it. we must be doing something good. Similar to that, you go to the zoo, you see these animals, kind of, and you're thinking, it must not be doing so bad, right? And so this is more technical here. I'm sorry that I, I left this bullet, but yeah, this is about reporting. So just to give you a feel of sustainability practice in general could be misleading because there's so much buzz around it. You know, everything, everything is around sustainability and ESG. And just talking about it is not enough. And you probably heard this, you know, a lot of, greenwashing practices, right? So what is greenwashing in very simple terms? You portray, you paint literally, as this image shows, uh, uh, companies practice an activity that they are green, they are environmental friendly, they are trying things, but they're really not, right? So this is pretty much greenwashing. They're basically, uh, basically lying, lying about how green they are, right? So to do that, they do a lot of communication around it. Lots of reports, lots of ads, lots of press release. I still do it to extend, but many years ago, I've studied this before. Language, words, rhetorics, very, very powerful tools. I can tell you that those things can help the companies big time, right? So I've, I have evidence of that. Um, but another evidence I found fascinating, in very simple terms, there was a study by, um, I think, Danish researchers, yes, in 2017, that look at the words ecological limits within a CSR report. So you would imagine that companies, when they talk about CSR and sustainability, they would sort of refer to ecology, the environment, et cetera, right? You would think that. 
Well, they looked at 40,000 reports for 13 years, okay? And they found that 5% sort of refer to ecologic limits in any year. And out of those 5%, only 31 disclose actual plan to say, what are they gonna do about it? How to address the issue? So you see that you can have like 100 page reports. Some reports are 100 pages long. And you don't even talk about the actual issues of how you're gonna address the social and environmental issues. Another one that is actually a, a very deep case study, very recent, a very interesting and recent study published on Exxon Mobil. How did they frame their communication around climate change? You know, climate change, they know this for a long time. They know it's bad. What they've been doing, fossil fuel is bad. Uh, oil industry is causing climate change. Okay, that's, but no, they have been able to frame some of these uh, communication so internally, they would talk about fossil usage, resources, combustion, but on the outside, they would talk about uh, risk. A lot of risk uh, reference, but not much about reality. So they portray that climate change was a risk rather than reality for the, for the longest time, okay? And these researchers have analyzed reports from dozens of years of what ExxonMobil is trying to communicate and how. So I'm sort of coming to, yeah, to, to close to end here, but I just want to also give a positive note because we have raised a lot of problems that we have, COVID or not COVID. You can see that COVID has worsened things overall. And you can see that these problems are here to stay, unfortunately. So I came across this quite recently. This is based in New Zealand. We talk about build back better. You may have heard this a lot. Building back better society. How do you do that? What's that mean? So they just, just put a definition from their, their website. Holistic concept using post-disaster reconstructions, recovery as an opportunity to improve the community's physical, social, environmental, and economic conditions to create a more resilient community in effective efficient way. And you can see that they divide this sort of build back projection, I guess, project to risk reduction, uh, more specifically to the health, the health on the, the, the local uh, risk-based zoning, uh, some of uh, education, uh, the recovery of the community, you know, psychological, this is, this is like a mental health kind of issue and an economic re recovery so that the well-being of the, the community. And then what's very important is that it sort of like goes along what I've said about plans and talk and lots of talk, less action implementation do the thing you said you're going to be doing and do it well and do it fully right so gotta have some institutional mechanism i know it's a bit of a word, word, um, full word here but uh, make things happen at the institution level legislate regulate monitor evaluate i think it's a, I, I like it. i mean it's a, there's a website for it i mean it's a very good uh, resource you can see how how to do that of course these are very some for some some of us is abstract. And start also at the personal and individual level. Okay, there are also these kind of uh, rethinking process, thinking differently about how we live our lives. Right. So we have recycle, uh, refuse uh, to do, to do. Maybe don't consume. Don't buy that thing that you don't need, or I don't know, or reduce uh, your energy consumption, or reuse stuff, or Instead of buying a repair and re-gift and recover, I mean, you can you know, go about that, right? So, and um, sort of my sort of my take in, you know, there's a lot of the greenwashing aspect. I'm a big sort of researcher on, I mean, not researcher, big, big uh, activist against these kind of practices. So maintain the professional or maybe even personal skepticism. Educate yourselves, right, and educate others, right, to 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 do this. Think outside the box. Uh, you, you, you know, there's a lot of youth. There's a lot of hope. I teach students full of ambition. They're very concerned about uh, society sustainability. So there's my hope. But because I also train them, I say, like, you've got to think out the box. Think forward thinking. Look forward. Okay? The old school model, obviously, very few things work in the old school model. Think progressively. Think forward. Be, you know, daring. And also, yeah. Uh, a critical mindset. Don't be afraid to be critical. Not everything that is given to you, as you can see, as it appears to be sustainable and socially responsible, 
It may not be. And it's likely not. And that's why you get a challenge. You're going to speak up. You know, we go on social media, we can activist. And there's things that as individuals we can do. And sometimes we are not so confident to do things because we are, you know, shy, which is understandable, which is, you know, you are, you are just, just, you know, you don't care. Hopefully you do care. Uh, many reasons. So that's sort of what uh, I have for you. Uh, I know we have got some time for tea. Uh, very happy also to engage. If we don't engage today uh, on the chat, you can reach me by email or I'm also on uh, the social media, LinkedIn and Twitter and my website here. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, I hope you got something out of it and look forward to your questions and comments uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you again. Now we're going to start the Q&A session. Um, you'll actually have a chance to win a free ticket to Lavazza Drive-In Film Festival if you participate in the survey after the Q&A session. So please do stay with us until the end. Okay, uh, so uh, feel free to submit your questions in the chat right now. Um, I don't believe there has been a question submitted during uh, the seminar, which is fine. Uh, so, Professor, I can start off with a very, um, I guess, vague question. It's up to you how you want to answer this. So you said, you know, um, a lot of people, a lot of corporations are saying ESG this, ESG, you know. Um, so as an everyday um, average citizen, do we jump on the wagon as well? Do we want to, you know, look into ESG and say, hey, I'm an ESG person too. What, how, what should we do as an average citizen? Very good question. So yeah, I like to speak from a perspective of, you know, I don't like the word average citizen because that sort of lowered the, 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 the status of, of, of the person, but no. So if you're not familiar with this, obviously, and for the, maybe some of you are here, I would say, well, now you know about this. Now you've heard that just because a person is called ESG something or does ESG work may not necessarily mean that they actually know or have, you know, is a true ESG uh, professional, because a lot of things they have actually jumped on the bandwagon. Big, biggest pet peeve with accounting or maybe finance people and even just corporate people who, or this is a, a fashion, uh, a trendy thing. So we're going to do ESG because it's a cool thing to do. Well, yeah, sometimes it makes money, uh, is popular, it has a good reputation. So as somebody who is part of member society, I would say do your part the way it is without necessarily labeling yourself, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You know, there's a, a change in behavior versus a change in, in discourse. You have to identify yourself as, yeah, now, you know, I do, I, I, you know, this is ESG, I do this at home or I do this at work. Do you need to portray that? Maybe, but the important thing is to do it yourself. Uh, do some research on your own of what you can contribute to. I mean, I don't have the most exp exemplary uh, ecological footprint lifestyle. Uh, I'm not here. I forgot to say my third, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a preacher, I'm a teacher, right? As my, my colleague would say, I'm not. It's always giving these talks and you feel like you are, you are a preacher, but I'm not. But yeah, there are things you can do without in, you know, flashing and say, I'm doing this here, I'm vegan, I'm doing ESG stuff, I'm sustainable. I think this is all secondary, right? So I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, just be yourself and try to do something even small for, for society. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we do have a question, a question from Mark. Is COVID a wake up call to humanity? Is it time to drop neoliberalism? Government is the problem, not the solution. Uh, and take control away from the self-directing corporation. Responsibilization seems to be a cop out by some governments. What do you think? Oh, Mark, that's such a... to jump in. Yeah. Mark, did you want to add something to the question or is that? No, I think I'm. I think I'm trying to express it, uh, Charles. But when I say the quotes, "government is the problem, not the solution," that of course is the line that's been um, behind the neoliberalist movement, which has basically reduced the public sector, increased the private sector, and left us at the time of when COVID struck with hospitals and respirators and and. Uh, without sufficient nurses and doctors, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And, and so the, the essence of my question is, isn't COVID perhaps a wake up call to mankind that we are structurally, institutionally setting up failures because of 
we've created corporations with self-direction that has led to the sorts of things your your presentation is just very eloquently and um, empirically demonstrated is bad for mankind and bad for the um, for the biosphere. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I got to say to the audience, Mark, my former colleague, is in Singapore. Woke up at six in the morning to listen to me, so I have to take his question and answer um, <laughs> as well as possible. So I will, um, yeah, try to answer um, well, as well as possible. So uh, yes, I think the, it, it was a hit on the head of everybody. I think nobody saw that coming. Uh, but I'm looking at the COVID crisis in sequence of month and time. Uh, it's been what 18 months 15 to 18 months uh, roughly uh, we've been hit by the pandemic i think the very first few months uh, everybody put themselves into question the whole system we have seen healthcare system um, you know social system in canada just compared to us there was a diversity of system uh, that led to uh, uh, solve and save lives versus others but i do think that in terms of um, going forward, it might have been a wake-up call for a few months, but I'm still a bit of a, a cynic in saying that it may go back to normal. People are getting so excited. The companies are getting back. It's good for the economy. It's great. People getting lives. I'm happy that things are open. I mean, yes. I, 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 I'm afraid. My concern, my worry is that we forgot already about last year, right? Because now we are seeing the vaccine. We see life coming back. Everybody's excited. Again, myself included and probably all of you. And so I'm not sure that this has even been, well, I think it has been enough to shock us, but I don't think it has been enough to change us, which is go back to my big picture where climate change, uh, all these problems are there. COVID was a crisis and I'm just worried that this crisis has not waken us enough, waken us up enough. So I think there was a bit of hope at some point where we're gonna change our lifestyle, change everything, change the systems. And then you hear a few months ago, Air Canada getting paid out bailout money and bonuses. That's an example of, yeah, the good old thing, the good old model. So sorry for my cynicism, but I'm being honest. <laughs> right, so. Thank you. Um, any other questions, please do feel free to uh, put them in the chat. Um, Professor, I have another question for you. Uh, you briefly talked about the 17 global goals for sustainable development presented by the UN. Um, could this list get longer down the road? And could we ever reach any of those goals realistically? Yeah. Very good question. So people ask, why 17? <laughs> why not a nice round number and put like 15, 20, 25, right? That's, I don't even know myself why they put 17. Uh, does it fit well on the infographics? I have no idea. Uh, do we need more goals? I am not sure. Well, I was in a workshop recently and so within those goals, there's a lot of sub goals with a lot of metrics and targets. So I think that there's a lot of work that can be done within those goals. Uh, I'm a proponent of simplicity. So I like SDGs because they're relatively simple. A um, lot of the issues that we have can fit in any of those goals, I think. Like even uh, I was invited to, to, be, to, to put my research and say, what goals is your research helping? And you know, I couldn't get all 17. I mean, there's maybe two or three you can do. And I think that, yeah, to your question of, can any of them be reached? Well, uh, it depends what you mean by reached because there will be levels of achievement. I don't believe in 2030, all 17 will be reached. There's no way, but we make progress towards them. That's the hope, uh, you know, there's a gauge, you know, you go from zero to hundred and how much progress have we made per country <coughs> and per organization, um, uh, per person. Okay, all of these goals can be also taken to the personal level. You can sort of translate them into individual levels. So um, yeah, I think we have to hope that some of them could be achieved. I think like things like partnership and things like um, you know, ocean and land, I, I have hope in diversity, biodiversity that the, there's things to be done. But the hunger and poverty, you know, the number one and two are, are the toughest ones, you know, to, to fight poverty and to alleviate poverty. Um, so I think it, it varies uh, within um, uh, which school you're talking about. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Brooke. It says, how do, we, how do you think we can reverse the flow of wealth occurring during the pandemic from the working class to the wealthy back to the working class? Let me read the question. How do you think we can reverse the flow? Okay. Um, I think the little thing, that, I mean, I, I haven't said it in presentation, but 
the system is flawed somehow, right? The, our, the, the, the capitalist system that rewards the already rich and, and penalizes the, the non-rich uh, has come to the point where it's not sustainable, obviously capitalism, the greed, the whole um, incentive, you know, corporations are uh, acting based upon their incentive, which is quarterly results and bonuses based on the quarterly results. So what they do? Well, they just meet those goals and they don't really go beyond that. So focus on the questions. Um, yeah, from the working class to the wealthy, um, you know, there's, a, there's been incentive to give back to the poor. The wealthy, the problem with human beings is the, the research on greed. You know, it's never enough for the wealthy to go back. So there's a lot of talking, maybe in the US, one of the lowest country that tax the rich, we well, got to tax the rich. You know, you cannot apply a flat tax. And I know that uh, some, of, some of the people here may not agree with what I say, but the tax system that is uh, uh, lower tax payment in terms of percentage for richer and like regular or more tax for the middle class is not sustainable. Well, I'm all for somebody who doesn't make, uh, who doesn't have a lot of wealth. Well, don't tax them, tax, tax the billionaires. And to me, that's one way to alleviate. And there's so many loopholes around tax laws, and I, I know from an accounting perspective, that uh, rich corporations and rich people uh, pay very little tax because there are ways around it. And so that's the flow of wealth uh, has to go from the rich to the government to distribute to the working class. Yes. Thank you. We have a question from Song. In regards to the responsibility of corporations and consumers, we saw with COVID the shift towards people to stay home and with businesses taking on best efforts to mitigate affirmation. What are some of the ways we can hold each group accountable before an additional shift in who holds responsibility, perhaps in reporting obligations and language or in immediate actions? <laughs> That's a long question, Song. <laughs> okay. Um... People to stay home. All right. So I would say, yeah, you know, the purpose of um, report is to make companies, organizations accountable. And, uh, and this is getting into my sort of my, my area. So when you are, um, the goal of making companies tell us what to do or what they do or what they will do for addressing those issues. The hope was that they would actually be doing those things and be accountable. It has become an exercise of like, oh, we're you know, just putting that out there on the report, but whatever we do, nobody's really checking on them. So yeah, the whole accountability issue and the re responsibility issue that uh, you're mentioning is causing by that, that the lack of you know, enforcement of uh, monitoring, the lack of consequences of what you don't do things. And so when you are look looking at what the, the shift for responsibility uh, shifted from the government to the people, well, it's because the government, under the name of the crisis, uh, maybe they didn't know what to do. I mean, this is a new thing. Uh, they have no idea how to solve these issues. So that's why you see these policies change and back and forth. They don't know what they're doing. I'm not necessarily you know, making excuse for them, but you have to understand what's been happening. So, but I think it comes from a previous inherent problem of having a uh, loose end of accountability. Public government accountability has been weak. And so maybe it's time to re revisit that model so that in times of hopefully not so big crisis, but there will be other crises, that governments are you know, able to be more accountable, uh, helping and serving the, 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 the citizens better. Thank you. Uh, I think that is it for tonight. So thanks everyone who submitted their questions. And I would like to wrap up the seminar at this point.